Both chambers of Congress are set to have a busy start to 2024 when they're back in session. Chief political correspondent Scott Thuman has the story on what lawmakers need and want to get done in what is shaping up to be a pivotal election year. After wrapping up a rocky 2023, there are a number of issues lawmakers hope to tackle in the new year. The biggest issue that I hear on the campaign trail is the border. We have not passed uh, the uh, critical support uh, for Ukraine, uh, for Israel. But one of the first on their to-do list, keeping the government open. Congress has until January 19th to agree on legislation to avert a partial shutdown. That's when funding for executive departments like transportation, veterans affairs, and agriculture expires. Other funding, including the defense departments, runs out two weeks later. And with a $34 trillion national debt, many members believe Congress needs to get its fiscal house in order. The economic situation with inflation and cost of goods and grocery store costs and gas is a situation that needs to become more controlled. And we can do a part of that here in the United States Senate and in Congress by reining in our spending. Another concern, the crisis at the southern border. More than 2.4 million people were apprehended in fiscal year 2023, the third record-setting year in a row. Right now, it's costing the American taxpayer about $451 billion a year to take care of all these. It's kind of funny how some of these mayors and some of these cities are starting to wake up. House Republicans will also carry over a number of investigations into the new year, including the impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden over his family's business dealings, particularly those of his son, Hunter. Democrats, though, feel attention should be elsewhere. We got problems with infrastructure, problems with health care. The rest of the world is looking to the U.S. With the House and Senate majorities up for grabs and, of course, the White House, too, a lot can happen between now and the November elections. In Washington, I'm Scott Thuman. Thousands of people joined a large migrant caravan in Mexico. Most are coming from South and Central America in what organizers call an, a, quote, exodus of poverty. The caravan comes as the U.S. has recently closed several border crossings due to a large surge. U.S. facilities aimed at housing migrants have been overwhelmed by those numbers. More than 2 million people were apprehended at the border in the 2022 and 23 fiscal years. And more than 100 people have been killed in airstrikes in Gaza. Israel's Air Force pounding the territory Christmas Day as the IDF continues its campaign against Hamas. It's one of the deadliest single strikes in the war so far. This comes as Egypt has presented a plan aimed at ending the war. The proposal calls for a ceasefire with a phased hostage, hostage release plan and the creation of a Palestinian government that would administer Gaza and the West Bank. Pope Francis calls for peace in Israel and Gaza in his Christmas Day message. The Pope calling the war a, quote, aimless voyage and an inexcusable folly. Francis is calling for the release of hostages and an, ed and an end of Israel's military campaign. He also blasted the international weapons industry and its, quote, instruments of death fueling war. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has been found weeks after his mysterious disappearance. His associates say he's being held in an isolated prison colony above the Arctic Circle. Navalny is serving a 19-year sentence that international observers say is political. He's Vladimir Putin's most prominent opponent inside Russia. Serbian police detained dozens of people for protesting irregularities in recent elections. Protesters alleged fraud in the elections that saw the governing populace win parliamentary and local elections. The Serbian Progressive Party denies vote rigging despite cr criticism from local and international observers. Yesterday's, yesterday, protesters tried to enter the capital city's council building, breaking windows before they were forced back. Students and citizens blocked traffic today despite a police warning. And new research into head trauma, raising concern about the safety of kids playing sports. What researchers have found and what experts are advising, that's next in your Spotlight on America on Fox 25.
The impact of a deadly brain disease, CTE, which is triggered by head trauma, including concussions, has been well documented in former NFL players. Now, scary new research finds you don't have to be a professional football player to be at risk of its devastating effects. As Spotlight on America's Dwayne Pullman reveals, the disease starts earlier and across more sports than previously known. For Brenda Easter, these words from her son's last letter are all she has left to hold. He said, thank, thank you, you all for wanting to help. But I can't be helped. Zach was a star linebacker at a high school outside Des Moines, Iowa. He loved every minute of it. Beginning with full contact football in third grade. I can tell you that by sixth grade, he started having some severe um, like migraines sensitivity to light. Brenda says he suffered repeated hits to his head. Back-to-back -back concussions in his senior year forced Zach to hang up his uniform for good. That was the end of his career. Football was over, but the effects from all those brain traumas were just beginning. Even as he served in the Army, Zach began to silently suffer. He hit it very well. On his 24th birthday, Zach could hide it no more, confessing during dinner with his parents that he was in real trouble. He goes, I'm struggling, I'm having memory loss, blurred vision, slurred speech. Brenda says Zach suspected he was suffering from chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, a degenerative and deadly brain disease similar to Alzheimer's, brought on by repeated brain injuries, including concussions. After years of undeniable proof of CTE's impact on pro football players, the landscape of the NFL began to change. But young athletes like Zach were not yet being considered. And the only way to confirm CTE is to examine the brain after death. Towards the end, he had said to me, Mom, there's no hope for me. I want my brain donated to science. In 2015, the week before Christmas, Zach ended his agony with a shotgun at a nearby park. Our hearts were broken. Brenda honored Zach's wish, sending his brain to a top lab in California, which confirmed Zach suffered from CTE. That's uh, a brain. That's a that's human That's a brain? half a brain, right. At the Unite Brain Bank in Boston, Dr. Ann McKee, director of neuropathology at VA Boston Healthcare System, invited us inside for a look and to discuss her latest groundbreaking study, which reveals a startling number of CTE cases in young athletes. Dr. McKee and her team examined the brains of 152 people, all under the age of 30. Most of them had played football, soccer, hockey, and other sports only at the high school and college levels. 63 tested positive for CTE. That's 41%. All the CTE cases, Dr. McKee says, are preventable. People, I need to speak for these families who've had these, this, un, this terrible tragedy that I know didn't have to happen. Meanwhile, Brenda Easter is pleading with all parents to consider whether head collisions and concussions are too high a price to pay for continuing to play a game. There's no need for you to continue doing the, something that may continue to harm your brain. Think about the future. For Spotlight on America, I'm Dwayne Pullman. Dr. McKee is not opposed to playing contact sports, but says all of them need to do a much better job of reducing head trauma. Temperatures for most this week are going to be a little bit below average here. Nothing really all that cold here, but coming up, we'll still talk about some cloudy days in our forecast, as well as if we're going to see any precipitation for the week. It's the season of giving and in Norman, a Christmas feast is making the spirits bright for many who are alone during the holiday. Fox 25's Peyton May introduces us to a family who is welcoming everyone to take a seat at their dinner table. For many families, a Christmas tradition is giving presents or sitting down for a meal. But for the McGarren family, the tradition is giving the gift that everyone has a meal. Got a bag, all the toys, all the 
this is our Christmas serving the people. Robert McGarrian, his kids, grandkids, and about 300 volunteers all look forward to this. A sit-down dinner with turkey, mashed potatoes, green beans, cranberry sauce, rolls, and of course, pumpkin pie. You know, after 37 years, we got it down pretty pat. Every year, the line for the community dinner wraps around Norman High School. Generally, we have about 16, 1800 come through here. And then we have about uh, 500 carryouts. The McGarians have opened their doors for a tradition that's become a staple for many families free of cost. It's extra cranberry sauce for me. I have people coming to me that say that uh, they lost loved ones and they didn't want to be alone on Christmas. And then I have had a, a few tell me that they uh, uh, lost their jobs and they wouldn't have had Christmas without this dinner. And for this important of a Christmas gift, the McGarians don't plan on stopping anytime soon. When I'm gone, I expect my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, my daughters to take over. In Norman, Peyton May, Fox 25 News. And we hope that you did have a very Merry Christmas. Our temperatures today, obviously a little chilly compared to where we have been over the past couple days, but nothing was record breaking or anything like that. We had a low this morning of 34 and we topped out at 44 today. Just so you know, the record low set back in 1983 was minus one. So we had a negative one for a low record low on Christmas Day set back in 1983. And then the record high has occurred twice in 1922 and also 2016. Temperature there, 73 degrees. So we were obviously not that warm, but also also not that cold either. Rainfall over the past two weeks has been very, very generous here. We've been very dry for a lot of the fall and really over the past two weeks we've had basically kind of two main systems come through during this time and we've had many locations here within the state come within about two to four inches worth of rain. Our latest drought monitor came out this past Thursday and you can see that we had a nice, nice improvement here compared to the previous weeks where in fact we have less than 1% now in the extreme. It's basically that small portion there of Osage County. Most of us though are in that very dry or moderate drought conditions and obviously we're still pretty dry in many locations but the severity of our drought has really come down here thanks to all the rain that we've received over the past couple weeks. The thing is though this is going to be a pretty quiet forecast for this week. Not a really whole lot going on here for us within Oklahoma. It's still pretty active just to our north. This cutoff low is going to be very slow moving here and so when these systems become cut off they're going to be slow to kind of just meander through as they go from west to east. So over the next couple days, this will still likely be making some impactful weather across portions of the lower 48, but not necessarily here in Oklahoma. We're still going to be kind of cloudy. There might be some times where there's some little sprinkles or some drizzle, maybe even some flurries in northern Oklahoma the next couple days, but just going to be kind of cloudy and cool for us here as that system spins off to our eventually our east and to our northeast. So tomorrow, if the in-laws are leaving, you've got really good conditions within the state of Oklahoma here with uh, upper 40s for highs tomorrow in in not only here in the metro, but also in Tulsa. And then also for locations in Texas, as you go into Arkansas, or if you're going into New Mexico, basically where the family came from, you've got dry conditions there. The problem is going to be, though, if you're driving north. So if you're taking I-35 north, especially in Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, those are going to be some trouble spots there with our cutoff low. There's still going to be the potential for 40 to almost 60 mile per hour wind gusts, as well as some heavy snow in those states. So blizzard conditions are going to be possible there. But for us here in Oklahoma, we're just looking at some kind of cloudy and cool conditions for the next couple days. Likely looking at our coolest day here on a Thursday, a high only around 40. But then we'll eventually get back in the 50s here by the time we get to the weekend. And then as we go into the new year, we'll be looking at probably another cold front coming through. But overall, though, our trend here is for us to stay pretty close to normal here with the temperatures going into early January. The thing to watch out for, it might be a bit more active here. Our models are saying it's above average in that 8 to 14 day trend. The thing is, though, is that uh, that's not really going to be represented here on all of our models. So as we go throughout the forecast here this week, it's pretty quiet. In fact, uh, this would be early on New Year's Day morning, so early on the on the first. It would be cool here. There might be some rain showers that may have kind of clipped the northeast part of the state, but we're overall though probably dry until potentially maybe next Wednesday. So not this coming Wednesday, but the next one where we might be looking at some precipitation here. It's overall a pretty quiet forecast, not only this week, but looks like a at least early start of January quiet as well. So for tonight, we dropped to a low of around 28 degrees with mainly cloudy skies. As you'll see, there might be some flurries at times here across portions of northern Oklahoma tomorrow, but 
if anything, you just kind of see the cloud just kind of spinning on through here. And so, again, if you are doing any travel across the state tomorrow, just kind of cloudy and temperatures in the upper 40s. The seven day forecast there shows, again, it's quiet here for a lot of this week, but uh, the sunshine will finally be coming out here by Friday. But uh, big travel plans here if you're going north, especially Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, problems there. Uh, and if you've got some planes, those might be impacted based on the connections that you have. But uh, otherwise, here in the state, we're looking pretty good. I need to see some 50s sticking around here. Yeah, we got only one day, uh, so it was it was nice here earlier last week, but yeah, it's been pretty chilly the past couple of days, and that's how it's going to stay here. Yeah, today it felt like 34 degrees outside. Or that wind chill like was that. not fun. Yeah, it was not fun. Yeah. Not, not good for your pets if you want to keep them outside. I, I have a catio back at home, and you can't really take your cats out there nope. when you know the weather's that cold. So come on, Jack, you got to do better for it's me. It's cold for Santo. Santo, yeah. he needs to have a little bit of yeah, some warmer temperatures. Come on. I'll try. I'll try to get it by sun by Saturday. I think it's going to be a better day. All right, that sounds good. Do you have, do you have a good Christmas? Just spent four days in the car, 2,000 miles, but uh, it was good. It was good. Good to know. Good to know. Well, we'll have more news after this. If you are struggling with a chronic illness or even a mental health concern, you may want to add music to your list of ways to feel better. Medical reporter Liz Bonus shares three ways music can help in healing. Hey there, hello to you. For years, researchers studying music say it plays a strong role in our healing. Those who've experienced that say it works in a number of ways. The first is often referred to as mood enhancement. Jameson Hornsby, who's just 12, says he's felt that many times playing the upright bass. I think it's very stress relieving just to be able to play and to hear yourself play. Jameson performed at this annual music conference held in Ohio, where research on the benefits of music are presented each year. The second way many here say music helps in healing is it focuses the brain. 
Amy Dennison says she's experienced that. How do you feel like music has helped you in healing? Uh, I have Parkinson's and um, when I play music, I'm focused and things go away and I can play. Finally, Carolyn Kara Georges says the third way music helps is the way it helped her daughter Callie heal from a congenital heart defect, relaxation. It really soothed her and we saw the power of music and how it can truly help just, you know, your whole body, I think, relax and be comfortable. And I think when you're relaxed and comfortable, you can heal. As she healed, she became a healthy teenager, which is especially why for youth, Carolyn says we should never underestimate the power of music. Interacting with music, playing instruments, you know, just that connection with, with that space really can help your body to just heal and, and be relaxed. And just to end on a positive note, it does not appear that you have to listen or play for a certain amount of time each day. Any amount will help in healing. I'm medical reporter Liz Bonus. Back to you. Well, still to come in tonight's Christmas sports report, a special look at the Oklahoma State Cowboys uh, really being Cowboys, plus some sounds from the OKC Thunder that's coming at you next. This is... This is Fox 25 Sports. Sponsored by Wade's RV. Whoever decided to pit the Cowboys and Aggies against each other in the state of Texas really did a good job of reading the room. Santa's gift to all of us from the Texas Bowl was a look at the Cowboys and Aggies going head to head, not on the gridiron, 
But in the rodeo games, the annual rodeo bowl saw each team take part in a series of seven different rodeo events from roping to calf branding to a hay bale toss. Oklahoma State, of course, dominated the Aggies, winning the rodeo event six to one. And historically, whoever wins the rodeo bowl does go on to win the actual bowl game. But even beyond that, Mike Gundy was just happy to see the guys have fun with it. Yeah, that was fun, you know. Um, we've been very fortunate. We've been to a lot of bowl games, and this is one of the coolest things that uh, at any of the bowl games they do with the teams together. It's really cool, the rodeo act, and both, both teams, the players, they get into it. Now on whether or not he was surprised by how well some of his Cowboys did. Bo Hardy, our guy that uh, did the rope and was four for four. Um, I have been told that Bryce Drummond, who was our anchor, um, it was our best roper. He didn't get to go uh, because of the score, but uh, I was told he was supposed to be the best one out of all of them. So um, always a surprise, but a lot of fun. Just two more sleeps until the Cowboys kick off for the real Texas Bowl. As for the Sooners, well, they're getting all settled in three hours west of Houston in good old San Antonio. The guys arrived in San Antonio Christmas Eve spent earlier today practicing in the Lone Star State. Now remember, this will be our first look at the newly run OU offense under co-coordinators Seth Luttrell and Joe John Finley. It'll also be Jackson Arnold's first start as QB1. Backing up Arnold is Davis Bevel followed by General Booty. But according to reports, Bevel is now in the transfer portal. So TBD on if he will be available for OU come game day. Now on the hardwood, while the Thunder couldn't gift their fans a Christmas win against the visiting Lakers, big man Chet Holmgren still gave them something to smile about while also giving more reason as to why he's in the top two for Rookie of the Year. While the number two overall pick has played a pivotal role in OKC's offense, his impact has been felt even more so potentially on defense. With his long arms, good mobility, and great timing, he's averaging 2.7 blocks per game. That's good for third in the NBA. As for one of his teammates, Jalen Williams, who played against Chet in college, well, he was asked to compare that of his playing days at Gonzaga with that of his first full season playing in the league. Um, ironically, he's more like free. I feel like, you know, he's able to like really showcase a lot that he can do. And obviously that's college. Like, you know, you guys watch it. It's hard for me to watch. Like even my brother plays just like everybody's just standing in the lane. So him in space, he's been doing a good job of getting his spots, reading, you know, how defenses are playing him. And, you know, he's a matchup problem for a lot of people because you can't really put anybody small on him and he stretches the floor well. So, um, yeah, I think defensively, honestly, I think is like the biggest, biggest takeaway from him as well. Now, even with Chet's heroics, the Thunder still fell to the Lakers. And afterward, Shea Gilgis Alexander gave some insight as to maybe why. Some make or miss league. Uh, some games, the ball goes in more than it should. Some games... It doesn't go in as much as it should. Um, now, you don't want to rely on shot making to to win games and be a really good team. Um, but, yeah, so you're going to have a nice like that for sure. Up next, they'll try to get back on the winning track as they host Minnesota tomorrow night. That's it for sports. Wishing you a very Merry Christmas. We'll be right back right after the break. The holiday season is filled with gifts and joy, but for some, it is a sad time. A reminder of a deceased loved one or the loss of a job. National correspondent Janae Bowen shows us what you can do if you have the holiday blues. I got the call early the next morning that, um, mm. The pain is still fresh for Harriet Ellis. Our granddaughter's first birthday that he passed away. She lost her husband to COVID-19 in 2020 and several family members since then, including her son and her father. She lost her job earlier this month and lost her vision and her right eye earlier this year. Even though I do have the blues, especially, you know, during this time when all the holidays come and we have the empty seats and everything. For Harriet, joy can be hard to find and keep. And she's not the only one. According to the American Psychological Association, 41% of U.S. adults say their stress increases during the holiday season compared with other points in the year. So allow yourself to normalize your feelings, to sit with those feelings, 
to express those feelings to those around you, get professional help if necessary, and to know that it's okay to feel what you feel and allow yourself to do so. Mental health expert with JustAnswer.com, Jennifer Kelman says, those with the holiday blues must sit with their grief. If they don't deal with it, it comes back in another way. It's easy to isolate and it's easy to think that that's the best thing for you, maybe for a little bit of time, but stay connected to those people and activities around you that give you joy. Even though Harriet admits it's a tough season. I have my grandchildren. I'm glad that I still have the health and strength and the faith that I'm able to raise them. They're seven and 10. So even though this is very, very hard, you just take one day at a time and just thank God that you're still here. She says she still has a lot to be thankful for. In Washington, I'm Janae Bowens. Let's take a look at what's trending. One animal shelter in Pennsylvania received a very special Christmas gift this year, an empty shelter. Oh, wow. They shared the joyous news on social media. However, they still do have one cat that came in as a stray. It's important that you adopt it. The shelter says it was a very different story just two weeks ago when their kennels were almost filled. Those kennels won't remain empty for long, though. The facility says they will be bringing in animals from other shelters in the state this week. The shelter says it has has adopted out almost 600 animals this year and reunited 125 strays with their owners. Santo, he's he's a rescue, isn't he? He is. Yep. He is. So you got to adopt that one stray cat. Don't forget what I said. That's right. right. And <laughs> both both my cats are uh, are rescued and then little Sky, we rescued here her here from the ditch uh, out here at the uh, at the front lawn here just uh, this past summertime. So yeah. Yeah. Make sure you, everyone adopts. Hey, look at us. We're saving lives out here. That's right. Well, could the new year bring a spike in marriage proposals? One retailer seems to think so. The largest jewelry company in the U.S. is, predict is predicting a marriage proposal rebound in 2024 after a pandemic trigger drop. According to Signet Jewelers, engagements will soar as high as 2.5 million in 2024. Data from last March also shows more consumers are choosing artificial diamonds over the real thing. And I mean, I got to take this opportunity to congratulate my sister because she just got engaged today. Congrats. Chanel, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> She's with her boyfriend, Kyle, in uh, Portugal today. So Ooh, quite the Christmas. Nice. I mean, that's yeah. a memorable day. Yeah, I would definitely say so. Yeah. Uh, any plans for you? No, not, not yet. Well, maybe, maybe in two I, years. I did, I, did, <laughs> I did mine last year, so I've now got uh, about 30, 33 days until the wedding. So at this point, so yeah, oh 2024 gosh. is going to be big. It's going to be big. It's going to be a big year, and we can't wait. And we can't wait for the 10 o'clock news coming up after this break. Two years. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah. You guys my check, my check. You guys have been dating, but still, you're still. Well, you know. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. No, but I'm hoping you did it. Hey, 
David has a sister who got engaged her named Chanel. Mike check. This is the Fox 25 News Late Edition. Will lawmakers pump more money into the school choice tax credit program in Oklahoma? We're asking that and more amid doubts that there's not enough set aside to meet current demand. Fox 25's Tom Ferguson joins us live with a closer look. So, Tom, do we know anything yet about what's on the table? David, we're only getting hints right now as the legislature won't officially be back in session until February. But with that said, top lawmakers are already weighing in on what could happen. School choice should not just be for the rich or those that can afford it. Fox 25 was there back in May when the Oklahoma governor signed the $150 million school choice tax credit package into law. Applications then opened in December. At last update from the tax commission, officials were reviewing about 30,000 applications. With so much interest, many, including Tulsa Democrat Melody Blancet, expect the program will hit its funding limit. For us to jump right in without some sort of better understanding about how this is working, I think is politics and not good policy. The Oklahoma House Speaker says he's confident lawmakers will get behind upping the funding cap to $250 million. Blancet, though, is urging caution before funneling an extra $100 million into the program. We need to follow and see to what degree those students are successful. Let's see what the outcomes are before we open the checkbook up. The Oklahoma Senate Pro Tem says he's always open to discussions on how to improve educational opportunities in Oklahoma. On the other hand, Oklahoma Rural Schools Coalition founder and director Erica Wright says, quote, it is incredibly disappointing that discussions among legislative leaders have already begun to lift this cap prematurely. Just think, if we invested in our public education system, we could rival every single private school there is. It's money. There are kids, thousands and thousands and thousands of kids that have no other choice. I care about those kids. Blancet says lawmakers need to figure out the bottom line if they want more money for school choice amid calls at the same time to nix the state income tax. And for those applicants making less than 150000 a year to get priority consideration, their applications have to be in by February 5th. Credits will be distributed on a first-come, first-served basis. Reporting live, Tom Ferguson, back to you. Thank you, Tom. It's the season of giving and in Norman, a Christmas feast is making the spirits bright for many who are alone during the holiday. Fox 25's Peyton, Peyton May introduces us to a family who is welcoming everyone to take a seat at their dinner table. For many families, a Christmas tradition is giving presents or sitting down for a meal. But for the McGarren family, the tradition is giving the gift that everyone has a meal. This is our Christmas serving the people. Robert McGarrian, his kids, grandkids, and about 300 volunteers all look forward to this. A sit-down dinner with turkey, mashed potatoes, green beans, cranberry sauce, rolls, 
and of course, pumpkin pie. You know, after 37 years, we got it down pretty pat. Every year, the line for the community dinner wraps around Norman High School. Generally, we have about 16, 1800 come through here. And then we have about uh, 500 carryouts. The McGarians have opened their doors for a tradition that's become a staple for many families free of cost. An extra cranberry sauce for me. I have people coming to me that say that uh, they lost loved ones and they didn't want to be alone on Christmas. And then I have had a, a few tell me that they uh, uh, lost their jobs and they wouldn't have had Christmas without this dinner. And for this important of a Christmas gift, the McGarians don't plan on stopping anytime soon. When I'm gone, I expect my grandchildren, great grandchildren, my daughters to take over. In Norman, Peyton May, Fox 25 News. It was obviously a little bit of a breezy Christmas here for us, but we are looking at some uh, kind of just cloudy conditions here for the next couple of days as a result of our low that is just to our north. Our highs today, you can see that they got to only 44 in the metro, so it was a below average day today for here in the city as well as for a lot of the state, obviously even cooler to our north, and we're looking at the cooler weather here to stick around for the next couple of days. Temperatures right now have fallen into the upper 20s and low 30s across the majority of the state right now, and we are dealing with some wind chills that are down into the 20s and even some teens across a lot of the state too. So kind of a chilly evening out there this evening, but we are pretty quiet as you can see on our Lucky Star Casino Skycam network. Not exactly looking at a lot of clouds currently and the radar has been fairly quiet for a lot of the state, but across northern Oklahoma we have at times seen some little flurries and some light snow showers here across northwestern and north central parts of Oklahoma, but most of the actual snow itself has been falling across portions of Kansas going up into Nebraska, South Dakota. So this is the actual low itself and it's a cutoff low which means it's going to take a couple days here for it to kind of clear the eastern U.S. So as a result of that it's going to be kind of sticking around here in the central parts of the country for the next couple days. For tonight we'll drop down into the middle and upper 20s. Dry tonight and also dry tomorrow too except for maybe a couple of flurries that could be possible again across north central Oklahoma. But highs will be more in the low and middle 40s for our highs tomorrow with a few more spots of clouds here. So we're talking about some cloudy days over the next couple days. It's quiet though for a lot of this week and we're going to be pretty dry as we go into the new year. David, back to you. Thank you, Jack. The Oklahoma City Fire Department tackling an apartment fire on South Agnew Avenue near Southwest 59th and Penn. Officials from the department say they were called around 430 this afternoon to the Country Club apartments, finding heavy fire on the roof leading to a partial roof collapse. No details yet on any injuries at this time and that cause is still under investigation. The McLean County Sheriff's Office says a suspect is in custody following a chase on I-35 near Goldsby. Officers arrested Devin Yandel after he fled from, a, from police in a stolen vehicle, then later on foot after stop sticks were deployed. Yandel was located on State Highway 74 near Maysville with help from the Garvin County Sheriff's Office, Maysville PD, and even Light Horse PD. Integris Health says they are the target of a cyber attack and patient data is potentially compromised. They announced the data breach last night, saying after becoming aware, they promptly took steps to secure the environment and commenced an investigation into the nature and scope of this activity. They add they will contact any individuals impacted, offering credit monitoring at no cost. Both chambers of Congress are set to have a busy start to 2024 when they're back in session. Chief political correspondent Scott Thuman has the story on what lawmakers need and want to get done and what is shaping up to be a pivotal election year. After wrapping up a rocky 2023, there are a number of issues lawmakers hope to tackle in the new year. The biggest issue that I hear on the campaign trail is the border. We have not passed uh, the uh, critical support uh, for Ukraine, uh, for Israel. But one of the first on their to-do list, keeping the government open. Congress has until January 19th to agree on legislation to avert a partial shutdown. That's when funding for executive departments like transportation, veterans affairs, and agriculture expires. Other funding, including the defense departments, runs out two weeks later. And with a $34 trillion national debt, many members believe Congress 
needs to get its fiscal house in order. The economic situation with inflation and cost of goods and grocery store costs and gas is a situation that needs to become more controlled. And we can do a part of that here in the United States Senate and in Congress by reining in our spending. Another concern, the crisis at the southern border. More than 2.4 million people were apprehended in fiscal year 2023, the third record-setting year in a row. Right now, it's costing the American taxpayer about $451 billion a year to take care of all these. It's kind of funny how some of these mayors and some of these cities are starting to wake up. House Republicans will also carry over a number of investigations into the new year, including the impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden over his family's business dealings, particularly those of his son, Hunter. Democrats, though, feel attention should be elsewhere. We got problems with infrastructure, problems with health care. The rest of the world is looking to the U.S. With the House and Senate majorities up for grabs and, of course, the White House, too, a lot can happen between now and the November elections. In Washington, I'm Scott Thuman. Parts of the plains and upper Midwest are staring down a Christmas blizzard. This is happening in central Nebraska. The Cornhusker State and Kansas are expecting several inches of powder in parts. And as you can see, the snow is being accompanied by strong winds. Some areas of South Dakota could see a foot of snow, according to the National Weather Service. And that same system is expected to bring thunderstorms to the south today and rain to the northeast by early Tuesday. Flight delays are expected due to this storm system, but the numbers are not all that bad right now. Flight tracking website FlightAware reports 130 cancellations in the U.S. today with nearly 900 delays. Now tomorrow, the day after Christmas, it's expected to be very busy at the airport. AAA projected 7.5 million air travelers for the holiday this year. That's the highest number ever. And it's not just Santa. On Capitol Hill, one senator made her own naughty list. It focuses on federal agencies and just how much of the workforce has returned to the office in this post-COVID era. Our national correspondent, Christine Frazal, caught up with Senator Joni Ernst to discuss what she found. It was a picture worth a thousand words. A federal worker bragging on Instagram, quote, my office for the next hour, showing himself teleworking in the tub. The employee, a team leader in scheduling appointments for the Atlanta Veterans Administration, which has some of the worst wait times in the country. One veteran in the midst of a mental health crisis called 10 times over a three month period and could not get the care she needed. We caught up with Senator Joni Ernst in her Capitol Hill office where she showed us her naughty list of government agencies with the lowest rates of in-office workers. Top of the naughty list, we have Housing and Urban Development and the Social Security Administration. The Social Security Administration recently came under fire for $23 billion in overpayments, with average wait times for callers of 36 minutes. In 2013, it was just 10 minutes. So we have seniors and people waiting on uh, disability work to be done by the Social Security Administration and they're not answering their calls. You go down the list here and you've got, you know, the Department of Defense at 25 percent, Department of Homeland Security at 31 percent. Right. That is still not even 50 percent of the workforce in the building making these huge decisions. When it comes to national security, we need people that are able to collaborate together, and that does not happen. Senator Ernst says government workers have called her office to complain about the lack of productivity more than seven months after the COVID public health emergency officially ended, calling the millions in tax dollars spent to pay for empty offices a waste. We need these folks to come back in, occupy these buildings here in Washington, D.C., so that we have proper oversight of those workers or we need to sell off all of this unused office space. I'm Christine Frizzell reporting. That big system, as you can see, is spinning across the central plains. So we got some snow that goes from Kansas all the way into the Dakotas with rain that extends all the way into the southeast. This low is going to be very slow to move to the east, so it'll impact us here in Oklahoma for the next couple days. We'll talk about it next.
The City Rescue Mission hosted their Christmas banquet event today, spreading holiday cheer and providing a warm and nutritious meal to anyone in need. Staff, volunteers and community leaders coming together to serve people and spread festive spirits, something organizers say is needed now more than ever. We have more people than ever that are experiencing homelessness for the first time. This is something new for them this Christmas. And so you might see people a little uncertain, um, like what to do. And, you know, we're hoping that our banquet, which is people from the community come in and they serve people. So, you know, we let our clients sit at the table and people bring them dinner. And a lot of people you'll see have it decorated and, you know, just having that conversation with them. And we're hoping this dialogue starts so that people can find out, you know, they're just like everybody else. We're all human and we're all in this together. For more details on City Rescue Mission and ways you can help, visit cityrescue.org. Our Christmas was a little bit chilly today as a result of the cooler air that was making its way into the area after the mild and rainy conditions over the past couple days. So you can see that we started off the day at 34 and we topped it at 44 today. Obviously a lot different from the record low of minus one set back in 1983 and our record highs set back in 1922 and also tied again in 2016 in the 70s there. So obviously it could have been a lot colder, but it also could have been a lot warmer. 73 would obviously feel a lot better than one below zero. You can see that over the past two weeks, we've seen quite a bit of rain here. And over the past two weeks, there's basically been two major systems that have come through the uh, really a majority here of the state. And so because of that, we've seen a good, healthy improvement on our latest drop monitor when that came out the other day. So you can see that we're now actually under 1% of the state within the extreme category. In fact, just a little bit there of Osage County is within the extreme. Everything else is severe, moderate, and very dry. And even though there's still large areas of very dry and moderate drought. Basically, the top end of the scale has really been diminished here as a result of all the rain that we have seen. So some good news here. It's going to be a pretty quiet forecast, though, this week. So over the next seven days, we're really calling for dry conditions here. So not a lot of changes will be seen when we get our next drought monitor that comes out on Thursday. Our next weather maker, though, not necessarily going to be going right over us, but the low that's cut off right to our north, which has been providing portions of the uh, central plains as well as kind of the uh, northern plains here, that storm system that uh, David alluded to earlier on is still going to be kind of situated here across Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, the actual low itself. So with it being cut off like this, it's very slow to move from west to east. And when that does happen, we can see the effects here over the past or over the next couple days. And so we're probably going to be looking at here in Oklahoma, mainly just cloudy skies and occasionally a little bit in the way of some flurries or sprinkles at times. But our travel will really be much worse here to the north of us. So for tomorrow, it's going to be one of the busy travel days of the year as everyone's going back home. You'll see that within the state we're looking good here, not only on the roadways, but also in the air too. But if you really are going to be going north here, again, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, a little bit in the way of eastern Colorado, a little bit in the way of eastern Wyoming, those are going to be your problem spots here as you're going to have some heavy snow still, winds that could be gusting over 50 miles an hour. So obviously our roads are going to be in terrible condition, but a lot of these southern tier states and a lot of the southern plains are actually going to be pretty good. But like I said, we will be seeing some impacts here from that system to our north, mainly in the form of some cooler than average conditions here. So we're kind of cloudy the next couple of days of temperatures that'll be in the 40s. But eventually, though, we'll be cooling or we'll be warming up into the 50s before we cool off by the start of next year. And you can see their 8 to 14 day, though, overall trending near average, but still looking a little bit wetter than average, too, during this time. So that would likely lead to a more uh, kind of a uh, uh, active weather pattern here, but that's actually not the case. Our models are fairly quiet here as we go into the early part of January. In fact, maybe one system is able to come through here by not this coming Wednesday, but the next one, and that's really all that it shows. So really overall very low confidence right now in things past the new year, but what we are looking at though is overall a fairly quiet stretch here going into early January. For tonight, we dropped down to 28 with mainly cloudy skies. Tomorrow you're going to occasionally see some flurries and some cloudy skies here across the state. Any flurries, though, will be mainly across northern Oklahoma. Uh, but really, though, it's just going to be kind of a cool day tomorrow with highs coming in around 47. And you can see that our seven day forecast does call for temperatures to remain generally below average for much of this week, and except for the weekend when the sunshine returns.
Could the new year bring a spike in marriage proposals? One retailer seems to think so, and so do I. The largest jewelry company in the U.S. is predicting a marriage proposal rebound in 2024 after a pandemic-triggered drop. According to Signet Jewelers, engagements will soar as high as 2.5 million in 2024. Data from last March also shows more consumers are choosing artificial diamonds over the real thing. Yeah, it's going to be... It's obviously one of the biggest questions you got to ask. I did it last year, and uh, I'm glad I did it. But yeah, it's yeah, those rings are a conversation. That's for that's sure. That's for sure. Yeah, it's yeah, just a little yeah. bit of a change. It, it causes some stress. Let's <laughs> just say that before we get too personal on air here. Well, before he delivered presents to children all over the world, Santa scheduled in some time with an adorable resident. A resident that is at the San Antonio Zoo. The zoo shared this video on social media Saturday. It shows Santa meeting the baby sloth Aluna. He tells Aluna that in order to be on his nice list, she will need to keep her tree and nest clean and go to bed early. Zoo staff created an Amazon wish list for Aluna and her fellow animals just in case Santa didn't bring them everything they wanted. That's pretty cute there. I don't think I've really ever seen a, a baby sloth before. Yeah, me either. I've only seen it in what? Cartoons? Yeah, all I've the sloth I always think of is uh, from the movie Zootopia. Yeah? <laughs> when they're working in the Department of Motor Vehicles and they're just going really slow. You're going to have to remind me about that movie. I don't think I've seen that. It's Who, a pretty good one. It? I mean, it's a computer one, but um, I, there's a lot of... I don't know who actually is in there, but... There's so it, many good animal stories that go around oh, this yeah. time of year. Yeah. I mean, we're talk, we were just talking about at 9 o'clock, that shelter that was nearly uh, empty at minus one cat. Yeah, I mean, just... Just great when you can have something like that happen too, because especially with the cold this time of the year, the animals need the love. Uh, we've got our next weather maker though is going to be that low that will be cut off to the north of us here. So we're not really expecting much in the way of any snow. There might be occasionally some flurries or maybe even a little sprinkle here and there, but we're look, just looking kind of cloudy here and cool temperatures in the 40s.